Hello and welcome everybody. Welcome to our second part of our Bind9 webinar series in 2021. So this is the part two of our webinar series and today we talk about long-term monitoring. So topics for today are identifying outliers in Bind9 log files. We will look at the monitoring using the namd stats file and also monitoring using the more modern statistics channel in Bind9. Then we have a look at open source tools to store and display metrics and other open source tools to search and analyze the logs. We give some best practice about how to uh, remote syslog uh, storage of the Bind9 logs. And at the end, we talk about the best practice of uh, having metrics to monitor authoritative and recursive servers. So let's jump right into it. Before starting monitoring, you should ask yourself, what are your goals with the monitoring? Here, I have some possible goals. Um, this is not exhaustive, so there might be other goals as well. Goals for monitoring might be to find outliers and anomalies which can point to potential security or performance problems or just configuration is issues that you want to fix. You can use monitoring to observe change in traffic patterns. Uh, for example, um, whether the world shifts from, from one, like from UDP to TCP in DNS, uh, like that, and uh, because TCP is more, uh, more heavy on the uh, on the CPU and on the network stack, you might need to then upgrade your installation, your DNS server installation. You might observe change in the load. That might be CPU load, uh, might be traffic load. That means more DNS traffic coming to your servers or even change in protocol use. So um, people who are monitoring their DNS might have seen that uh, beginning in September, 2020, Last year, there was a, a new DNS resource record that became popular, which is record type 65, which is the HTTP record that has been introduced in the latest um, Apple iOS and macOS um, operating systems. Other changes might be IPv4 versus IPv6 usage or UDP versus TCP usage and so on. Let's start by uh, looking at the first way to analyze log files, which is to find outliers. And outliers are about finding anomalies in the log entries. That is, log entries that don't appear during normal operations. For example, if you have a primary server with a couple of secondary servers, Seeing zone transfer messages between these services is just normal operation. Seeing a zone transfer failing between the servers is not normal and would be one of the outliers. Um, people who have uh, failures in their log files in, in the normal sense, um, they probably have a bigger problem than uh, starting with monitoring. So one approach, uh, and it's just one approach, but it's one approach that I really like to use is uh, to use uh, artificial ignorance. And artificial ignorance works best for small and medium-sized installations. For larger installations, we have something else that I will cover later on. Artificial ignorance was first described by security researcher Marcus Ranum in um, an email, which I have linked here. But I will explain what is artificial ignorance. So the concept of AI, artificial ignorance in this case, is that we, um, uh, we group all log messages in either two buckets. Uh, one is the kind of log message that we do not care about and that don't need our attention. And the other ones are the log messages that we care about and that need our attention. So all the log messages that we don't care about that don't need our attentions are just noise. That might be still valid to collect these log messages because we can use them for statistical analysis, um, like the zone transfer logs. So um, 
it's it's nice to have a log entry that tells us that zone transfer was successful, but that should be the normal case. That is nothing that we are really concerned about. Still, we might want to collect the um, the, the log message because it tells us uh, how fast the zone transfer is working and how many bytes are being transferred, and that might be useful in a statistical analysis later on. But we don't care really um, about the periodic zone transfers that happen. So in an artificially ignorant system, we filter these messages out. We suppress them. We don't want to see them. And everything that is left there, so after we have filtered out all the log messages that we don't care about, then by definition, are the messages that we do need to care about um, is what is left. Is that what we see after filtering? Whenever we see a message that is passing the filter, we have to decide uh, in which category these messages fall. Either uh, these are new messages that are not indicating any security or performance issue, meaning this is a new message, but it is a new message that we don't care about. So we have to adopt the filter, which is usually something like a regular expression. Um, and that needs to be updated in the software so that it hides the, these type of messages in the next run. Or it is a new message that indicates a security problem or a performance issue. In this case, we don't want to suppress the message. Instead, we want to, um, we want to have the messages go away by fixing the problem, by fixing the root cause of the problem. So we need to investigate what, what, what causes this message. We have to go into the system and fix the issue. In, in, in both cases, the message will go away. Either because we have decided that we don't care about the message, then we filter it out, or it is a message that we care about, then we fix the root cause for it. The ultimate goal for artificial ignorance is that when we periodically run uh, the artificial ignorance software on the log files, that we have no output at all, no new messages. So some people run uh, AI software periodically, like every 24 hours or every hour, and then the results are sent via email or via chat, um, like Slack or something like that, to the group of administrators. In the ideal case, even if there are no new log messages, there should be still a message being sent, a message saying there's no new message, there's nothing to report. Because you want to catch the, uh, the situation where the, uh, the sending of the message is failing. So if you, if you expect a message every morning when you open your email client, that's good. And you probably will recognize if that mail is, uh, is not there. And in case that a new log message appears, it must be dealt with in a certain amount of time, uh, possibly until the next run of the software, which is kind of an internal service level agreement between the administrators, meaning that someone needs to decide whether that is some, something to filter out or whether this is something that has to be fixed on the machines in the configuration, et cetera. There are multiple implementations of artificial ignorance. The ones that I use, and later on I uh, link to uh, to um, instruction pages where I have uh, written down a tutorial how to compile and install and uh, use these these software tools, especially the first two. Um, I will link them later on in this webinar. The first one is called Log Templator from uh, um, a guy called Ron Dine, and the second one is NBS, never before seen, from uh, Marcus Ranum. And there's also um, an article on uh, Linux Weekly News, how to use artificial ignorance with syslog ng. And you can possibly um, apply the concept of artificial ignorance also to other systems like Logstash or Elasticsearch, or um, if you have a Splunk system, something like that. You can do that as well there. And in the easiest way, you can use grab with some regular expression, although that is possibly a, a lot of manual work. 
Additional information about artificial ignorance. There is a very good um, uh, PDF document from uh, Marcus Ranum that I've linked here. It's from one of his uh, trainings on, on logging. And these are 200 and, and some odd pages about uh, very good information on, on, on logging and uh, how to uh, get the most out of log information. Uh, Rainer Gerhardt, who is the author behind our syslog, has written about syslog normalization, which is also going into that direction. And uh, David Lang from Intuit has a talk about uh, building a 100K logs per second uh, system, which also has some interesting um, information in there. So that was artificial ignorance and how to find outliers in the system. Next is the monitoring from named stats file. Now, named stats file is um, a function that has been in bind nine from the beginning. And with the command rdc stats, um, it will trigger bind nine to write a statistics file to the uh, storage on the server. Usually, that statistics content is written in the file named dot stats. And that is uh, located in the bind nine service home directory. The name of the file and also the path of the file can be changed in the bind configuration file namely.conf. That namely.stats file is always appended. So whenever you do RDC stats, um, the old content of the file is not overwritten. Instead, the new statistics content is always written at the end of the file. On the next slides, we have uh, some examples of what we can find in namely.stats. And this is a namely.stats from the latest version of bind uh, 916, uh, the latest release version that is. And if you have uh, an older version of bind, you might see a little bit less because with uh, some new versions of bind, there's uh, sometimes new statistics information that's coming in. So in the very first line, starting with three pluses, uh, and then the um, text statistics dumped, you see in the parentheses a large number. And that is actually the Unix timestamp. This is the number of seconds since the 1st of January 1970. And uh, this uh, uh, stamps the, um, the, the time when the RDC starts command has been issued. Then we have the, the incoming query types. That is, what kind of DNS queries have been received by the DNS server? Uh, either normal queries or notifies or updates. And usually we can ignore the iQuery or status once um, these are just uh, noise and not really of any concern. And below that, we have the record types that has been queried, uh, whether that is IPv4A records or IPv6 quad A records and so on. Then we have the return codes that have been sent out to the clients or the DNS resolvers, depending whether this is a bind server that acts as an authoritative server or as a resolver. And we have, uh, in case of a resolver, we have the queries to external DNS um, that has been done from, from this machine. Uh, in addition, uh, the bind name server keeps a lot of statistics about its inner workings. For example, about the, the network, also the uh, um, kind of query results being sent back, uh, how many queries have been dropped for various reasons, uh, failures, um, and so on. Uh, a lot of useful information can be found in the namely.stats. Here we see um, additional information uh, for example, also the, the performance of outgoing DNS queries or more correct the, um, the performance of the, um, of the answers coming back for all the outgoing queries. Information about the caches in case of a DNS resolver, how many cache hits, how many cache misses, how many uh, memory is being used for the cache. About um, the persona statistics. Um, this is something that you have to enable 
on demand or not on demand, but um, it's not enabled by default in the namedconf uh, configuration. So if you want to have statistics per zone, uh, you have to enable that um, in the bind configuration and we'll cover the statements to use uh, to, to enable this in a moment. And these are the statistics for the zone example.net that we see here. And we have uh, glue, uh, per zone glue cache statistics, which can help to find um, issues with glue records for your zones. For example, if um, you have name server entries in your zone files that require glue, but glue is missing, then um, bind will um, record these statistics in here. And at the very end of uh, a statistics dump, we have the minus, minus, minus statistics dump. Uh, and then again, the same timestamp as before. And um, these both timestamps, they kind of uh, enclose the whole statistics information. And this is being used by parsers that parse the data to find um, each chunk of statistics data. So I mentioned already that zone statistics are not enabled by default. They need to be enabled in the bind name configuration file. You can either do that globally in the option block with zone statistics, yes, or uh, you enable that um, per zone just for the zones that um, you care about the zone statistics. Um, because statistics require bind to do some additional work like incrementing all the variables per zone. This takes a little bit of uh, CPU power, but usually it's so little that you can't really measure it. So um, I would say that there is no ill effect when uh, um, enabling zone statistics. Uh, at least I've never seen any performance degradations because of zone statistics. So many popular monitoring tools and um, yeah, network monitoring tools, they offer modules that can use the data in namely store stats. And a few of them uh, are listed here. There are many, many more. I would say that the monitoring using the data from namely stats is the, the most supported one because it has been in bind nine from the very beginning. But there are some challenges with the monitoring uh, using namely.stats. Um, the file will always grow. I've told you that it always appends at the end. And you should create some mechanism to purge the file from time to time, maybe weekly, maybe monthly. I've seen installations that run for multiple years and where the namely.stats had never been purged. And because there was some script that was calling RDC stats like every minute or every five minutes, that file has been grown to be uh, four or five gigabyte in size. Now, that by itself is not a big problem if there's enough storage space, but um, the parsers that, that go through the, uh, the file, they need to find the new information. Usually what they do is they, they open the file and then they search from the beginning to the end. And the larger the file, the more CPU power is being used from the plugins and also the more IO is being generated and that can hurt the performance of the, the name server itself. Second challenge with namely.start is, is that it contains human readable data. It's, it's not really designed to be possible by software, uh, even though it's not the, the hardest format to parse uh, with software, it's not created to do that way. So if the content of name data starts change because there's a new bind nine release, some monitoring plugins might fail because the parser is not well written and buffs about the new content in the file. So whenever you upgrade um, bind and you have um, a monitoring tool running that uses name data starts, look at um, the change log and, and see if there's a change in the statistics output. And um, if even if there's nothing in the change log, it might be a good idea to um, install the new version first on the test system, do an RD stats, compare the output with the previous release version and see if something has changed in there. And then just observe if the plugin just still works correctly. 
some because sometimes these kind of monitoring plugins uh, tend to fail silently so they uh, they don't give an error message, but they, they just might to give wrong metrics, which is equally bad. There is a new modern way of getting statistics from Bind9, which is the statistics channel. And the statistics channel uh, allows an outside software to retrieve statistics from a Bind9 server via the HTTP protocol. That means that Bind9 has a tiny built-in web server. So it's, it's not that Bind9 has a full-blown Apache or Nginx web server built in, it's just a very tiny web server. And the plain HTTP protocol is actually very simple. So it's, uh, it's, it's not a big deal to have that in Bind9 and uh, it's, it's very convenient. That web server provides statistics data either in XML, which was the original format and optionally also in the JSON format. You can use either one. So using the statistics channel has some benefits compared to the older namely.stats. One is that you can retrieve the statistics over the network. So with the namely.stats, um, you have the statistics on the machines, but you usually don't need the metrics directly on the machine, you want to collect them in a central monitoring system. So you have to transfer the data over, uh, which is often done by um, um, SSH or a secure copy or something similar to that. Uh, you don't need to do that with the statistics channel because it's already um, offered over HTTP. It's just a way than to uh, use an HTTP request to the DNS server and fetch the data there. Um, because the statistics come in structured data, either XML or JSON, it's very easy to parse and it gives much more robust monitoring, meaning that if the XML or JSON changes, like if there are new metrics in there, um, well-written software usually don't break, especially ones that don't implement their own XML or JSON parsers, but use some standard libraries to parse the XML or JSON. Also, the format of the statistics is versioned. So if there is a large change of the statistics format, um, it will not break the existing tool because uh, the old format will stay and um, all the new stuff will then be in a new version of the uh, statistics channel that needs to be requested uh, explicitly. Enable, uh, in order to use the statistics channel, there are some dependencies on the software side if you build bind yourself or if you install bind from some packages. Uh, in order to provide statistics over XML, bind 9 must be compiled with the libxml2 library. And for JSON output, the bind 9 server needs to be compiled with JSON-C library. The ISC bind 9 packages that um, are available directly from ISC, uh, contain support for both the XML and the JSON functions. So if you use these packages, which are also often more up-to-date than the ones you get from the Linux distributions, uh, you also get all the features that might not be enabled in your Linux or Unix distribution. The Mind9 statistics channel over HTTP is not enabled by default. You have to enable that in the namely.conf. And the statistics, they have their own statistics block. It's an own configuration block starting with statistics channel. And then you define the IP addresses and the port numbers on, on which the HTTP server should run. And you also uh, give one or more access control lists that define which clients are allowed to fetch the data. Here in this example, we see an IPv4 statistics channel configuration and IPv6 statistics channel configuration. The XML statistics come with an XML style sheet. So what you can do is if you have a Chrome based browser, that is a, a browser that uh, uses WebKit as its backend. So that can be a Google Chrome, that can be Vivaldi, Brave, that can be the new Microsoft Edge. 
um, or Opera or something like that, then the XML data will be retrieved if you go with the browser directly on the port number of uh, the statistics channel on your DNS server. And it will render the data in a nice format with bar graphs and uh, nice tables. And what we see here are some screenshots, uh, some examples of the bars and the tables that are given back uh, from the statistics channel. So um, you don't even need some extra software to fetch the statistics data and create graphs out of it. Um, a very um, easy way to get the information is already built into Bind. And the rendering is not done on the DNS server. It all happens then in um, your uh, browser. So it's not extra overhead for the DNS server itself. So about the JSON statistics, JSON stands for JavaScript Object Notation, and that's an open standard file format um, that uses human readable text. So it's easier to uh, read for humans than XML. And sometimes, or most often, it's even uh, faster to parse than XML. Um, and also JSON is what's being used in uh, other IST products such as Kia. Um, the Kia DHCP configuration file is also uh, in JSON format. And here's an example of the JSON output, the statistics output um, from bind nine in, in the JSON format in a text editor that does JSON highlighting. Um, almost all popular scripting languages, Python, Ruby, um, even um, Go or non-scriptal language or Lua, for example, they have uh, JSON parsing capabilities directly built in. So usually it's quite easy to write own tools that that read JSON output and um, then transform the data into something usable. My security recommendation for the statistics channel, um, you shouldn't expose the statistics channel to the open internet without authentication because it reveals internal information. For example, the, the list of zones that are hosted on the DNS server. Um, and it also increases the attack surface. Uh, even though the HTTP server is quite uh, simple and there might not be a lot of potential security possibilities in there, it's still a good idea to not have the statistics channel open to the, to the whole internet. Uh, best practice is to, to, to have the statistics channel listen only on internal management networks. Um, what I usually do is that I have um, four DNS servers that are directly in the internet. I have some kind of VPN connection to these machines and then I have the statistics channel bound to the IP addresses of the, the VPN. And you should protect the bind nine statistics channel with a reverse proxy uh, with basic authentication or a TLS client certificate so that not everybody can uh, fetch the statistics information from there. The IEC knowledge base has some additional information. If you are interested, you can find more information about Statistics Channel uh, on these two pages in the knowledge base. So now we look into some more complex or elaborate uh, tools to store and display the metrics from the log file. One tool that is quite popular nowadays is called Prometheus. And that is an open source tool that is relatively easy to deploy and it scales well from small uh, systems, meaning just a handful of machines to monitor to even large networks with many thousand machines that uh, needs to be monitored. It's written in, in Go and it um, creates a, st a static binary that can be just deployed on the machine and started there. And there are also um, uh, Docker containers or other container formats that um, are available to easily deploy Prometheus in a network. Prometheus works with agents. Uh, the agents are called the exporters in uh, the Prometheus language. And these um, exporters, they collect data, um, usually on the uh, machine that is being monitored could also be over the network 
And these exporters offer then the, the data over HTTP in a key value format, which makes it quite easy to um, verify that an exporter is working correctly because once you have started that on some machine, you can just point a web browser to that IP address and the port number you've chosen for the exporter. And then you see a web page that lists uh, all the uh, metrics data, that is the keys and also the values of the metrics, um, which makes it easy to troubleshoot these. And also usually uh, these web pages that are being uh, returned by the exporters, they have additional information about the metrics. So they explain what the metrics mean and how the metric can be used, which is also for, of help. Um, it's also quite easy to write custom exporters because all you need to have is some tool that collects data locally on the machine and then exposes that on a web page. So either you use your favorite scripting language that has a built-in web server like Python and Ruby have that, um, which is quite easy then to use or in the simplest way you install um, a, a full-blown web service such as apache or nginx and then you have a script can be a shell script that periodically uh, collects the metrics and and writes that into a static um, uh, html file that is being then served by the web server and that in itself is an exporter then that can be used by prometheus um, for bind nine, there are exporters that can collect the local statistics data with namedy.stats or via the network, which is then the statistics channel. So we have all these agents, the exporters, and then there is a central Prometheus server that collects the data from the agent and stores it in a time series database. And that data that has been stored in the central Prometheus server can be queried of a web interface. There is a, a simple visualization of the data directly available in Prometheus, but most people use Grafana um, as uh, a visualization uh, front end that will use the data stored in Prometheus and will create nice graphs and gorges and uh, alerts from the data. So here we see the architecture. It's um, it's a pool architecture in, in the way that the Prometheus server, the central server, it connects the to the agent. The agent exposes the data over HTTP and, and the central server connects to all the agents one by one, collects the metrics and stores it. So here we see the Prometheus server asking uh, one by nine server um, for the statistics. And here it uh, uses, um, it, it asks, another machine uh, over the uh, over HTTP. And then either the, the administrator directly goes with the web browser to the Prometheus web user interface, or the user goes to a Grafana machine, uh, which can actually be hosted on the, on the same machine, doesn't need to be two machines. And then Grafana will um, in the backend ask Prometheus for the data and will visualize the data. So here's a list of um, uh, Prometheus exporters for DNS. The first three are uh, directly bind nine related. The first one is the stats exporter that runs locally on a bind nine server and that makes use of the namedy.stats. So it calls automatically periodically RGC stats and then reads the namedy.stats file. We have a bind nine statistics exporter that makes use of the statistics channel directly from ISC, which is part of Stork, which is uh, part of the Kia project. Even though it's part of Kia and Kia is mostly DHCP, there is some interesting uh, metrics collection available there for bind nine service as well. And in future versions, there might be even more stuff um, in Stork that can work with by nine servers. But for now, you can use uh, Stork as a statistics exporter uh, for Prometheus for by nine servers. And there's an independent um, statistics exporter that uses the statistics channel as well. There's a latency monitor exporter that direct, especially manage, uh, measures the, the latency for DNS queries. Uh, one exporter, um, 
checks the signature validation for DNSSEC signed zones and can alert if um, uh, signatures um, expire. The DNS uh, record TTL monitor checks the TTL scene from the outside world. The node DNS exporter uh, looks for the DNS configuration, the client configuration, uh, can be useful for DNS clients or cloud instances. And the DNS lookup test exporter is a very simple exporter that just does uh, configure DNS lookups and reports whether that lookup is um, successful or not successful. So there's many options uh, there. So this Prometheus is mostly about storing the data and um, uh, creating nice graphs out of this. And the next one um, that I will show here is more about searching and analyzing the log that is uh, directly diving deeper into the log, into the metrics and uh, figure out what might go or what has gone wrong at a certain point of time in um, the log files. And what I want to show here is the so-called ELK stack. ELK stands for Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana, which are three open source products, which together create the so-called ELK stack. And it's a very popular solution for centralized log management. It's kind of the open source equivalent to a Splunk server. Uh, sometimes Kibana as the graphical front end can also be replaced for Grafana. Uh, depends what you like most. If you already have Grafana for Prometheus, uh, you might not want to have Kibana, which works a little bit different. Um, as a visualization, you can then use Grafana as well for Logstash and Elasticsearch. So what is Logstash? Uh, Logstash is a system that collects log data from various sources, uh, bind servers, but also email servers and firewalls and intrusion detection systems such as this. And it can normalize the data it can structure the data so it can take in free from log data and parse that and create a structured data that computer programs can use and it can also filter the data so you can implement uh, artificial ignorance for example in logstash as well then after transformation after normalization and filtering logstash stores the data in a central database which is usually Elasticsearch, but it can be other stuff as well. It can be syslog, it can be just a file, can be some databases or even some background monitoring systems. What is Elasticsearch? It's a distributed search and analysis engine. Uh, distributed means um, the because the amount of data can be quite large. I know customers that have terabyte of DNS data per day that they store in Elasticsearch, one single machine might not be enough to work with it. So Elasticsearch can uh, scale over multiple machines. And still it has one single database that you can search, which is quite nice if you work with large amounts of data. It provides log analysis, uh, provides monitoring, anom anomaly detection, and also some CM security information and event management capabilities. And then Kibana or Grafana is the graphical front end. Um, you can use Kibana or Grafana to visualize the data stored in Elasticsearch. You can query for the log data. For example, you can search, give me all the queries for a certain IP address in a certain time frame, or give me all queries for record type NAPTR that contain a weight of 30, something like that. These kind of queries you can give into uh, the system and it uh, allows you to interactive drill down into the data set. So you can almost click on everything in the graphical interface and it will then drill down directly and filter on directly on that item that you have clicked on. So the ELK stack architecture, it's a, it's a push architecture in that way that the Logstash server doesn't go out to the bind name servers and, and fetches the data. Instead, the bind name servers send the data over to the Logstash server that then processes the data. And that can either be syslog, so remote syslog from the bind name server to the Logstash server. It can be file beat, um, 
FileBeat is a part of um, is a piece of open source software that can read any kind of log file and already pre-process them on the source machine and then send it over its own in, uh, protocol to Logstash, which might have some benefits over um, a syslog because the, the data is already structured and it can buffer the data and so on. Something that might be complicated to do with syslog. And then there is uh, PacketBeat. Uh, PacketBeat is a way to get the metrics information directly from the network. So if you have a, a DNS server that doesn't provide you with a rich metric that you know from Bind, maybe the, the Microsoft Windows DNS server, uh, you can use PacketBeat to, to get the raw network information. So you read the, the DNS packages flying by and you uh, pick the metrics out of the DNS data coming by and you send that to Logstash as well. And because it's listening on the network, that works with really any DNS implementation. So Logstash is then processing the data, is filtering and normalizing the data, and is sending the results to Elasticsearch. And that can be a single machine, or it can be three machines like here, or it can be 100 machines, depending on the amount of data that you have in uh, your network and your logs. And then the uh, administrator, uh, goes to the Kibana or Grafana web user interface and that queries then the data in the Elasticsearch database. So data sources, I already covered that. You can have syslog, you can have file beat, or you can have packet beat, and there are even more, but these are the uh, popular ones that I know of, at least for DNS. And here we see some screenshots, um, thanks to um, my friends from Netcon Consulting that use um, ELK as a way to um, monitor DNS data um, for their customers. And here we have an example of a slave name server load. Um, we see here the, the load over time on um, a secondary name server. And on the bottom, we see the different query types for the servers. These are three secondary servers. And uh, we see that they, for whatever reason, receive different queries. So the, the first one on the left receives uh, different query types uh, and um, also different eDNS uh, patterns. So what, um, either queries with eDNS or without eDNS, then the other two interesting data. Here, another visualization as an example. Uh, here we see the query types on the left side and we see the query flags, uh, whether that is with eDNS, with TCP, um, with, uh, without eDNS and so on, it, whether it is recursive queries or uh, non-recursive queries. And this is an example of a graph created by hits on an, a response policy zone. This is a response policy zone to uh, stop malware URLs. And here we see as an example, the uh, uh, the domain names that are in the RPZ data uh, and how often they've been uh, queried over a certain amount of time. Um, Usually you can hear uh, with, uh, if, if you see this, these hits periodically, you can even see um, uh, and detect a kind of botnet communication there. We see the counts here and with drilling down, um, this would be if you click on one of the list entries at the bottom, you will then see the IP addresses that really um, created these queries. And then in an enterprise network, you can then look up or check these machines, whether they are infected with whatever uh, malware created um, this uh, this queries in the first place. So it's quite, quite an uh, impressive uh, machine. It requires uh, some amount of uh, installation and, and configuration at first, but it really pays off. Um, once you have this machine, you have a much better insight into your DNS and in your whole network in, in, in general. So we have seen some tools that we can use for log analysis. And now let's 
see some best practice for bind nine locks and remote syslog. So it's uh, very good to have a central lock server where you can correlate the lock events and do central lock analysis that can either be just a central syslog server, which is the easiest part. It could be a Prometheus or could be something like um, um, Elasticsearch and an Elk stack. Log data can either be transferred with syslog, which is push or systemd journal, which is either push or pull. Um, additional information on, on that we had in the first session of our webinar series. I would recommend to use TLS transport security for sending log data over untrusted networks. So if you have DNS servers in the internet and you collect log data from there, secure that transport with TLS or uh, a VPN. So it shouldn't go unsecured over the network. And the central server should store the data in a, some kind of structured way, either a database. Um, and if that is a, a large amount of data, then uh, a central server might actually be a cluster of multiple machines, like with the example of Elasticsearch. You should plan your logging. Um, you should estimate the number of log events you have per second, and you should plan for the worst case, meaning a DDoS attack on, on your system, for example. And when you have the number of events per second, then you have to estimate the size of each log message as um, a rough estimation, 100 to 150 bytes per message is good for bind log files. And then with that information, you can estimate the load on your logging infrastructure. Can your network sustain the data rate that you have there? Um, does the log collection have some um, impact on the uh, performance on CPU, on network, on RAM, on the by nine name server? So logging should not really uh, negatively affect the operation of your bind server. Can the central server process the data fast enough, especially if you do normalization, if you do filtering, if you convert the data into structured data, and also can the storage keep up with the data rate? Yeah? Uh, be careful here with uh, log servers on virtual machines. I've seen uh, virtual machines that were not capable of uh, keeping up with the, all the data that they needed to store because the, the IO was not good enough. Um, also check how long then a typical query into the data takes. So if you want to know something about a certain query, test out um, how long it takes to really, for the, for the central log system to return the answer. Um, seconds or a few minutes is good, hours not so good. Um, how, how good does the, the system scale? Can it scale over multiple CPU cores? Uh, does it work with uh, non-unified memory architectures? Uh, can it scale over multiple machines even? Um, if you are in Europe, um, or if you care about data privacy, uh, how will the log data be secured? Because in log data, there can be uh, personal identifiable information. Um, do you need to encrypt the storage? Do you need to encrypt transport? You probably need to have user authentication. Uh, who, so who can query into the log data? And you might also want to have log source authentication. So um, some authentication of the machines that send the log data in. And of course, the log server itself needs monitoring too, not only your DNS servers. So normalizing the data. It is a good idea to normalize the log data before sending and storing. Unfortunately, the syslog data and also the bind nine log data is unstructured, meaning that there is a message, but um, there is no certain uh, structure that highlights IP addresses in the messages. If you if you need to 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 find the IP address in in a bind nine log message, you have to parse the message and be intelligent about detecting IP addresses in there because they are not always in the same field because there are no fields in, in the log messages. 
Uh, some modern logging systems, such as RSYSLOG or SystemD Journal, they can convert unstructured SYSLOG data into structured data. So you give them a template saying, this kind of message that comes from a bind server has this structure, and then the logging system will create fields and will always store IP addresses in an IP address field. And such structured data is then more easily to filter and search. And um, if possible, that, that normalization and creating the structure should already be done on the source. I'll see next slide on that. Um, the, the latest syslog RFC, RFC 5424, uh, defines a structured log format um, that could be used if you are logging over syslog. For example, you can use rsyslog to convert bind logs into structured RFC. Uh, 5424 uh, to send that uh, on. And uh, the link here to the RSYS log uh, documentation um, describes how to do log normalization for different formats. Uh, some of the bind nine categories can be very chatty, uh, especially during a DDoS attack. Um, you can have then an overload in logging might be good to filter out irrelevant information before the lock um, is being sent over the network. Artificial ignorance can be used for that as well. And uh, some syslog server implementations support local buffering, but that needs to be configured, meaning if the network or the central log server cannot cope up with the amount of data being sent, then the syslog server on the bind nine uh, side will detect that and will start buffering the log information on local storage. And once the network is clear, uh, once the load on the central server is going to normal again, it will then play back the buffer uh, syslog information to the central server so that no information is being, being lost. However, if you create such a buffer, make sure that the local buffer cannot fill the local storage, meaning create a dedicated log buffer partition, or if the software allows that, uh, limit the buffer to a certain size. Uh, the link here explains how to do reliable forwarding of syslog messages with rsyslog, which explains buffering um, so that no log messages get uh, get lost on the way. So I talked around already about that, about log server security. DNS data can contain sensitive information, IP addresses, sometimes even personalized domain names. Uh, for example, some shops use uh, personalized URLs uh, on wildcard domain names. So every Every customer has its own personalized domain name that they use as a new URL. Um, and if that log data goes over untrusted networks, it might be good to and secure that with uh, uh, TLS. Yeah, don't store large amounts of log data on the servers itself, especially if the servers are exposed to the internet forward the log data to, towards an internal secured system. Um, access to the data should be, uh, should be authenticated. And it might be a good idea to keep access logs. So who has had, had access to the logging information? Uh, also keep that. And it's a good idea to, to delete old log data, especially the raw data after some amount of time, like a week or a month and just keep the aggregated data and the, the information about the outliers. Uh, you don't really care about uh, 1 million log entries about successful zone transfers. That's, that's not an outlier, that is just noise. Um, if you work with security sensitive data, um, for example, if you operate a top level domain, something like that, or very sensitive domain, um, you might want to apply cryptographic signatures to the log messages so that you are able to detect tampering. Um, SystemD journal D supports that with forward secure sealing. Uh, we had that in part one of our webinar series. Arsys log also support that with the keyless signature infrastructure. Keyless infrastructure signature infrastructure also support blockchains. So that is, I'm not sure if that is terribly useful uh, for this, but it can help to get funding, especially in academia. 
And don't forget the human factor. Uh, you can condense and you can aggregate the log information in, in very sophisticated way. But in the end, it has to be some human that needs to check the log data and react on the log data. And here's a quote from Marcus Ranum again. Uh, Nobody can replace a good analyst with a Perl script. So you can't 100% automate uh, the, the log analysis. There always needs to be at some point of time some human that, that looks at the log data and, and sees what's going on. The, the challenge is to condense the log information so that uh, it just takes a, um, a few few minutes per day or so to to go through the log files uh, well not the log files but the remaining log information to uh, find the the interesting data there so last before we come to an end here is the best practices for metrics what do you want to monitor Here's a list of uh, metrics that you might want to um, monitor for DNS resolver. The, the memory consumption is, is one part because a DNS resolver builds up a large cache and you want to make sure that you don't run out of uh, physical memory there. Um, if your machine starts heavy swapping uh, or paging out uh, a lot of data, um, that might be a problem that you don't have enough uh, physical memory in the machine. A little bit of paging, a little bit of swapping is not a problem, um, but it shouldn't occur too often. CPU load on a resolver is important because uh, um, compared to authoritative servers, uh, resolving is more work and uh, a DNS resolver can hit the, um, the, the upper bound on, on a CPU load. And network card utilization, um, network cards could be the bottlenecks, especially if there's problems with the drivers uh, in the operating system. A number of clients per time unit, number of concurrent clients per UDP and TCP is interesting to monitor. Um, the rate of incoming TCP versus UDP queries. Uh, there might be a change in the operating systems, the clients using. Uh, you want to detect that if clients starting switching over to TCP which also might be an indication that somewhere is a problem with um, fragmentation or with large answers that uh, are larger than the EDN's buffer size. And also the, the rate of outgoing TCP versus UDP queries, uh, because there might be on the authoritative side a problem with large answers as well. Number of outgoing surf fail responses, that is the resolver is sending surf fail to clients that might, an might be an indicator for DNSSEC validation issues uh, or a server issue somewhere. Latency from the outside world, uh, either generic for, for every query or you monitor that for a set of well-known important domains such as Google or Facebook or whatever is important for you. And the rate of format error responses to what clients might be an indication, especially if you are an access provider. Uh, might be that uh, an update to the CPE machines on the customer side is failing and all of a sudden uh, thousands of, um, of modems on the client side are sending um, uh, mangled DNS queries to your resolvers and you might want to detect that early. Or there might be malware infected clients that are where the malware is badly written and creates form errors, that is uh, also a good thing to know whether there is an infection going on. Metrics for authoritative servers are different from the metrics for um, resolvers. A number of queries over, over time, which is the, the DNS load on the server, the amount of UDP and TCP queries and the uh, percentage of TCP over UDP is interesting. The size of the DNS answers, uh, whether that matches your eDNS zero setting, should be below 1,232 to prevent fragmentation. Um, percentage of truncated answers being sent out. Maybe you have some very large DNS resource record sets in there and you might want to optimize that. The number of NX domains answers per time unit. Maybe there is some important link on your website that has a typo in the domain name and that creates a lot of NX domains or it could be an indication of a random subdomain attack and surf fail answers over time. That might be an indication for a server misconfiguration or for DNSSEC issues. 
Um, network card utilization is equally important for authoritative servers. Uh, if you use DNSSEC with NSEC3, in that case, and I would say in that case only, you, CPU utilization is important on an authoritative server. Uh, zone transfers per time unit and also zone transfers errors um, are important to monitor. If you do response rate limiting, uh, then monitoring per client IP, who is being rate limited and for what reason. Uh, the DNSSEC signing, if you have DNSSEC signed zones and automated key rollover should be monitored for events and errors. And also the propagation of SOA serial numbers um, over the primary and secondary zone servers, that is the zone update latency. You might want to measure that. And if you have dynamic zones, then the number of updates per time unit uh, might be also an interesting metric to have. And with that, we are almost done and we are already at the end of the hour. Um, because I haven't had enough space and time in this webinar, I've um, created extra pages for an example session of log templater and NBS. Uh, quickly have a look there. One moment. Here we are. It looks like this. It gives an example on how to create log entries in bind in the log configuration, then how to install the software and how to use it in a step-to-step -step guide. I hope this is uh, useful. If you have additional questions, just don't hesitate to send me an email and I will help you with that. And um, the information and screenshots about bind nine log analysis with ELK um, has been provided by uh, my good friends at Netcon Unternehmensberatung and you find the link here. And if you um, are uh, wrangling with an elk and you need help, well, the good guys at Netcon are probably there to help you as well. So what's left is to um, point you to the upcoming webinars. So we have the session on load balancing with DNS DIST in April. And in May and June, we talk about dynamic zones, basics and advanced topics. And with that, and with just one minute over time, we come to the question and answers. Thank you very much, Karsten. That was great. Um, we only have uh, so far four questions and JP has already waded in and answered some of them. Um, uh, one question I think a lot of people might be interested in, are the stats provided by named.stats and the stats channel identical, or does one of the two provide more data than the other? I'm not 100% sure. I would say there is probably some differences. Mm. But, JP, so. JP has, has uh, said that the stats channel gives uh, more information, but uh, most of the additional information is mainly useful for developers. I but, would say so as well, yeah. Uh, the the important stuff is available in both. Um, so one question that isn't answered is from John. Uh, it seems that packet beat could lower the performance hit on the bind server for full query response logging and would also help with unstructured logging. Um, is this, uh, does this sound correct? Yes, that is 100% correct, especially because packet beat can uh, run on a dedicated machine, it doesn't need to be run on the bind name server itself. So uh, packet beat can be used without any performance impact on the bind name server. Well, that's a that's a huge point then, because of course, uh, full query and uh, response logging is uh, um, puts quite a load on the server. Yes. Um, and uh, Anshul asked, uh, can we specify uh, particular metrics to be served uh, either over the HTTP or the statistics channel? Um, I'm not aware of that. Yeah, that's a, JP's uh, uh, opinion as well was, uh, you know, you get what you get in each yeah, channel. And you can filter that with JQ or similar tools. Okay, well, that's it for the questions. Uh, thank you very much for another uh, useful webinar. I'll send out a link to the recording um, and the slides after a day or so to process those. Yes, thank you everybody. Have a good week and see you next time.